Um, today, our uh, uh, guest is Özge Ülkem. Uh, I'm so happy to host you here, Özge, uh, as a speaker of Üçgen. So she will tell us about uniformization of generalized the elliptic sheaves. And uh, yeah, please. Yes, thank you uh, for the invitation. So today I'll talk about uniformization of generalized the elliptic sheaf. But first I want to start with uh, uniformization of some objects that we already know about. Let's, for example, elliptic curves over complex numbers. We, it's known that uh, if we have a lattice in C, then by using Weierstrass P function and its derivative, one can show that actually E our elliptic curve is just quotient of uh, complex numbers. So this is a uniformization. It gives us a simplified, uh, more simplified object to work with rather than given by an equation. We just have uh, a quotient of complex numbers. And in a more general setting, we have Riemann surfaces. Uh, one can think of elliptic curves uh, which are example of Riemann surfaces of genus one. And in, for Riemann surfaces, for compact Riemann surfaces, we have that it's either uh, the Riemann sphere, or if genus is zero, uh, or it's an elliptic curve if genus is one, or if genus is greater than one, it's a quotient of a Prout plane. So, the question is, what are the analogs of such objects in function field setting? So, welcome to the function field world. So, in the uh, classical world, the construction goes as, so we start with Z, then we take the quotient field, and then the completion, and algebraic closure of it. Completion with respect to the usual absolute value. So, in function field world, as an analog of Z, we start with FPT and then take the quotient field of it and take the completion of it with the corresponding then Archimedean valuation and take the algebraic closure actually, but it's not complete with respect to uh, the, the non Archimedean valuation. So we take the completion of algebraic closure. So this works as an analog of this setting in function field world. So, but the question is, why is this the right analog? Uh, so, there are many similarities between Z and FPT, actually. I will just state a couple of them. First of all, both of them has finite residue fields. And both of them has uh, finite unit groups. And uh, another one is for a non-zero polynomial in FPT, you can make it monic by multiplying uh, by a suitable unit. Similar to Z, by multiplying with a suitable unit, you can make every integer positive. So another uh, similarity will come from the roots of unity. Mainly the roots of unities in classical world are uh, roots of such polynomials, nth root of unities are the roots of x to the n minus one. And the root, these roots form an abelian group, i.e. z modded under multiplication. So the question was asked uh, is, are there analogs of these polynomials over uh, in the function field setting? And the answer is yes, given by Carlitz. Uh, and one can construct such polynomials over FPT, uh, I mean, it's true for FQT also, but to be at the most basic setting, one can think FPT. Uh, so one can define these Carlitz polynomials by iteration and linearity. Namely, we say 1x will be x, and tx will be x to the p plus tx. Here, I want to already mention the Frobenius, which will come later. Then by using linearity, you can see that t to the n x will be t of t to the n minus 1 x and use this definition 
which lead us for, for any polynomial over Fp, one can define uh, these polynomials by using linearity. So if you look at the roots of such polynomials, they form an FPT module, not an abelian group, but an FPT module. And uh, if you adjoint the roots uh, of these polynomials to FPT, it gives us a Galois extension with Galois group isomorphic to this, actually. And this is similar to the case in the classical case, if you adjoint the m roots of unity to the Q, you have the Galois group uh, of Z over M star. Now, if you recall, I will be by, sorry, by using these polynomials, we will define a new uh, model structure on C infinity. So C infinity, C infinity was the algebraic closure, uh, was the completion of algebraic closure. Now you can see this as an FPT vector space naturally, and in particular as an FPT module. But now we'll define a new module structure, new FPT module structure on C infinity, namely uh, M and a polynomial in FPT will act on alpha by this polynomial. In particular, if you look at t, it will give you alpha to p plus t alpha. With, and this is called Carlitz model. Then Drinfeld came along and generalized uh, Carlitz definition in the following sense. So a Drinfeld model of rank r will be an injective morphism defined by you take an element and send it to uh, C0 plus C1 tau and till uh, CR tau to the R, uh, where R is C or degree of A, and coefficients also depends on A, and if tau is Frobenius here, uh, and C infinity tau uh, is denoted for twisted polynomial ring. And this is a generalization of Carlitz module, so that Carlitz module is now a Drinfeld module, module of rank one. More precisely, it will be like defined by t says rho sense t to tau plus t, which is actually nothing but this. We here we already have the Frobenius. And uh, so far, I always defined everything over FPT, even made the analog for FPT at the very beginning. But one can define in a more general settings the Drinfeld modules. Mainly, uh, one can start with a smooth projective curve over FQ, where Q is a power of F prime. You fix a closed point. And A will be the ring of regular functions away from infinity. And if you have a, uh, an A field, then you can define Drinfeld A modules over K. I won't give the exact definition to be more precise and give the idea. Uh, Drinfeld introduced these objects as an analog of elliptic curves in the function field setting. One uh, uh, analogy comes from this. So let lambda be a lattice of rank R in C infinity, then you can construct an, a Drinfeld module of rank R, R associated to this lambda. And actually homotetic lattice will give us uh, isomorphic Drinfeld modules. So classifying Drinfeld modules is same as classifying lattices. Yeah. So how one gets lattice? Let's start with a, a point in C infinity R and take the A span of it. But up to homotopy is enough. So let's look at the projective space and then take a point at the pr projective space and take the A span of it. This A span of this point in the projective space gives you a lattice 
f and only if its coordinates are linearly independent over k infinity. If and only if they don't lie on the k infinity rational hyperplane. And this leads us to the definition of Greenfeld Aprav plane, which is analog of uh, Aprav plane in the classical case. Uh, so a prof space in general defined as you consider the R minus one projective space over C infinity and take out all the K infinity rational hyperplanes. And it's not just a, just a set, but it has a R minus one dimensional uh, rigid analytic structure on it coming from Murat Tips building. Why it's called a proud space? Because if you look at the, uh, if when is when r is equal to, then you are looking uh, like p1 over c infinity and take the p1 k infinity, which is similar to the case of a proud plane in classical case. But then this discussion actually gives us the idea of the theorem that the set of isomorphism classes of rank R, uh, of rank R Greenfeld models over C infinity is in natural bijection with the set of such orbits. And as you might see, this is similar to classical case, to, to the case of elliptic curves and Riemann uh, surfaces. So there are actually more similarities. I will list some of them. Uh, well, some of them, some of the similarities are for elliptic curves, we have like Z, like Z lattices, and in Dreamfeld models, we have FPT uh, and FPT lattices. From these lattices, in both case, one can construct exponential map. And this exponent, you, by using this exponential map, one can get actually exact sequences that should be zero, not just uh, right exact, but exact sequences. Isogenies are given in both case by lattices. And we can uniformize dream pad modules and elliptic curves by using upper planes. So uh, Dreamfeld, as I said, Dreamfeld introduced these notions of Dreamfeld modules. He actually called elliptic modules because he wants to give an analogy of elliptic curves in function field setting. And then he, to prove Langdon's correspondence, he defined elliptic sheaves. So uh, now I'll start with first elliptic sheaf case. So let y be a smooth projective geometrically reducible curve over f cubed, and we fix a closed point denoted by infinity. And from now on, degree infinity will be one only for simplicity and to uh, simplify some notations. S will be always an FQ scheme, and sigma s will denote the Frobenius endomorphism on S, which is defined as identity on points and as the cute power map on the structure sheet. And sigma will be identity times sigma S on uh, the fiber product Y times S. Now, an elliptic sheaf of rank R is such a ladder consisting of locally free sheaves over locally free sheaf of uh, all Y times S models. Uh, together with morphisms, with some conditions, which I will come now. But before, just I mean, just to talk about. So these uh, morphisms actually gives us modifications around infinity. So if uh, away from infinity, all these sheaves are actually isomorphic. So. Uh, an elliptic sheaf of rank R will consist such a ladder so that first condition tells us that if you go enough steps on the horizontal way, you will uh, get a twist of the first one. So uh, epsilon E 
uh, I plus R is just isomorphic to EI infinity. And co-kernel of the horizontal map supported on infinity. So away from infinity, they are isomorphisms. And co-kernel of them is locally free OS module of rank one. And on the diagonal maps here, they they are also locally free OS module of rank one and has support on the graph of a morphism of such a morphism. This morphism is called characteristic of elliptic sheaf actually, and it plays an important role in the uniformization. And uh, these elliptic sheaves are categorically equivalent to Grindfeld modules. If the characteristic of elliptic sheaf is different uh, than infinity. So for simplicity, uh, I will just give the idea, but for simplicity, let's say S is spectrum of a field, then how to construct an elliptic sheaf from Dreamfeld module is, well, the main idea is to construct a local free sheaf over X times S, you can construct a local free sheaf on the affine part and uh, then take lattices around the infinity and glue them. This is an incredibly useful thing to use. And I will be using this idea very often from uh, in the following uh, theorems and definitions. Uh, I won't go into detail, but basically you can construct uh, a, a sheaf from a module by looking the Proj construction. And on the converse side, if you have an elliptic sheaf and you want to construct the inside module, you just look the global sections. Uh, of one of these sheaf, and actually this will be your Dreamfeld module. Now, uh, so by using these elliptic sheaves, Dreamfeld proved actually global lambda's correspondence. So, but since then, there are many generalizations have been worked out, and I will talk about two of them briefly. One is the elliptic sheaves. Here, this stands for an Azumaya OY algebra, uh, such that at the generic point of Y, this uh, Azumaya OY algebra is a division algebra of degree T. And for the elliptic sheaves is a, a letter like this, but uh, now on each EI, you have an extra Azumaya algebra action. And that's it basically. And of course, this uh, D action has effect on ranks, but besides that, it's similar. Why this is a generalization of elliptic shift is the following. If D is the matrix algebra, then the elliptic shift is just a direct sum of elliptic sheaves via Morita equivalence. <clears throat> so to give the idea of a D elliptic sheaf, let's see an example. So let's assume degree infinity one and S will be spectrum of uh, FQ. So I want to construct a D elliptic sheaf. So I want to construct a ladder of locally free sheaves, actually. That's the idea. And I know that uh, via these conditions actually that uh, away from infinity, these sheaves are isomorphic and the morphisms are isomorphisms. So I will consider around infinity because these horizontal and diagonal arrow, arrows uh, gives us modifications around each infinity and the conditions on co-kernels tells us how big these modifications. So this, so let's say, and I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna use periodicity also. Uh, well, because of this periodicity, it's enough just to look at, at some range, right? So it's enough to define finitely many uh, local free sheaves, beautiful local free sheaves. So let's say epsilon zero is 
E0 is D. And let's look at this talk, which is the infinity. I assume that uh, D splits at infinity, which means it's isomorphic to matrix algebra. And now I need to define E1 infinity. So how one de defines that? So I have a matrix. Let's look at here when D equals 3. So if we have a let, uh, such a matrix, which is F E0 infinity, I multiply the first column uh, of this by Z uh, minus 1. This will be E1 infinity, the stalk of E1 at infinity. And then let's I multiply the second column of E1 infinity by Z minus 1 and get E2 infinity. And let's multiply one more, the third column. And but then it's nothing but Z minus 1 of E0 infinity. So by defining like this, I already have the periodicity. I have injections and I'm modifying around infinity. So this multiplication by Z minus one gives us the JIs, the horizontal arrows. Now we need to define the uh, diagonal ones. <coughs> it's uh, since the degree infinity is one and S is spectrum of FQ, sigma star is nothing but identity. So we have here actually TI goes from EI to EI plus one. So I can just take these to be JIs. Then, I mean, by this, we get a dialectic sheet. That will be the idea to construct a generalized dialectic sheet also. And another generalization of elliptic sheaf is Frobenius-Sakis sheaves. So, so far, we had only one curve and we fixed one point and work over here. Then Stuller asked the question that, let's say I have a finite covering of this curve so that infinity splits completely. And he defines uh, sheaves over this big curve over the covering. And they are called frobenius sheaves. sheaves. Uh, and if t is 1, so x is equal to y, a frobenius sake sheaves is nothing but elliptic sheaf. So we are back to that. So, so far, what we did was to start with elliptic sheaves, then, well, to say there is the elliptic sheaf as a generalization and frobenius sake sheaves. And what I will introduce today is kind of putting them together and call them generalized elliptic sheaves. So frobenius sake sheaves actually can be taught like elliptic sheaves that can have many poles. So generalized elliptic sheaves also can be uh, thought of the elliptic sheaves that can have many poles. So I will start with setting. Uh, X and Y be smooth projective geometrically reducible curve over FQ uh, so that X is actually a covering, finite covering of Y of degree T. We fix a closed uh, place of Y so that the uh, infinity splits completely and A will be the ring of regular functions out of infinity, outside of infinity and B will be ring of regular functions outside of infinities, outside of T, and L and F will be function fields of this. And D, as before, now uh, denotes Azumaya or X algebra. Now I'm over the, over the covering. And I assume that D splits at each infinity. So, uh, the infinity j's are isomorphic to the matrix algebra. And uh, I denote by that uh, the ramified places for D, which means they don't split, D doesn't split at those places. So, I mean, infinity j's are not in this set, for example. 
So uh, if so for an elliptic sieve, we had letters, but we have indices in Z, right? And these morphisms were modifications around infinity. But now I have many infinities, not just one. So I will have indices uh, as t tuples in Zt, and uh, there's a partial ordering on Zt, namely you uh, order, you compare the uh, components, it's defined component wise. S be an FQ scheme, and sigma S will be Frobenius and the morphism as before, and S prime will be a closed sub scheme of this fiber product such that the second the under the second projection it is finite of uh, sorry it is finite of degree t and once more we assume that degree infinity is one just to simplify the notation and definitions so a generalized the elliptic sheaf over s is a pair such that E is uh, such a letter as before, and psi is the closed immersion. So from S prime to uh, this fiber product such that under the uh, second projection, it is finite locally free of degree T. So that in here also, I have this lattice, but I have, if I go in up space on the horizontal way, I get the, where I started with a twist. And so I get, if I go the many steps, I get EI uh, infinity one, infinity T. And these horizontal arrows, co kernel of these, are supported on T. T was the set of infinities lying above this infinity. <coughs> And now it, there is a difference occurring. So in the previous case, in the elliptic sheet case, I have one infinity. And so I, I said that the co kernel of them, the co kernel of horizontal arrows are uh, locally free of rank one over OS. But now I have many infinities. But if I consider around each infinity only, I will get either zero, the co kernel will be either zero or locally free sheaf. So, uh, locally free sheaf of rank the vector bundle, not just a line bundle, but a vector bundle I will get. So, how this is defined is actually because of indices, let's say. Uh, so, I had tuples, such, such tuples because I have many infinities, right? And each of the components here actually tells us whether there is a modification around that infinity or uh, not, I don't modify. So if, for example, I1 is zero, that means I didn't do any, I don't do any modifications around infinity one and so on. So this, is a vector, the co kernel of the horizontal arrows is a vector bundle over around that infinity if previously I modified that infinity. Otherwise, we have zero. And the co kernel of the horizontal arrows are supported on image of psi. Psi is S. And they are also locally free of rank T, B over S prime. And this psi is called characteristic of a generalized the elliptic shape. And uh, I allow that psi can meet with infinities and I want them to meet with infinities actually. And uh, why this is a generalization? Because if, for example, D is MDOX, then a uh, generalized the elliptic sheaf is nothing but a uh, Frobenius Hickey sheaf. 
And if t is one, your if t is one and x is equal to y, a generalized dielectric sheet is just a dielectric sheet. So let's look at an example as before. Yeah. So I define E0 to be T copies of D this time. And uh, the stalk of E0 at T at the set of infinities will be uh, the T copies of uh, the infinity one to T, the infinity T. But I assume that D is split at infinity. So these are, this is isomorphic to the matrix rings. So now I'm actually uh, using the same idea as before. So we let's start with, uh, so I want to modify this, right? But now I can modify around any infinity. Uh, so let's say I is uh, delta one to delta t where delta j is zero or one. But let's assume for simplicity uh, let's say I1 is 100, zero, zero, which means I want to modify around uh, infinity 1 and the rest is 0. I don't modify around infinity 2 till infinity t, I don't modify, but around infinity 1, I will. This is how. Now, what we are doing is then we, I will define e, uh, I1 t by multiplying first column of this first matrix by Z minus one. Then similarly, uh, let's say I two will be is one, one, zero, zero. Then I will define e, uh, I two T by multiplying the second uh, the first column of the second matrix by Z1 minus one. And by continuing like this, I will, I will continue till RT is one. So by continuing like this, we can get I, uh, E, I, T, T. And these monomorphisms actually gives us the horizontal arrows in the definition of generalized elliptic sheet. And we need to define TIs once more, uh, but so assume S is uh, spec FQ to the T, then we have a sigma star is identity. So I define TIs to be JIs here also. So we get a generalized dielectric sheet. I mean, once more, it's enough to define like this because they're all isomorphic outside of infinity. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you are doing around infinity. Now one can define uh, level structures or uh, one can define levelized structures on generalized elliptic sheaf also, uh, where, well, I is a beautiful, let's say beautiful closed subscheme, then, uh, a levelized structure on the generalized elliptic sheet is an isomorphism, is such an isomorphism which is computable with the action and the probing structure. And, but, uh, so as I said, this uh, map psi is called the characteristic and plays an important role. But now I will put a condition on characteristic actually. I will consider generalized elliptic sheets with uh, that have characteristic of certain form, which is of that kind of form. I know it looks ugly, but let me try to state. It actually uh, comes from very natural definitions by using like Hilbert scheme, but I don't have enough time to give the construction. So, uh, let's assume that psi is given by such morphisms where here t is y minus j uh, union b scheme. Here b is the image of bad uh, places under this finite covering. 
and J is the uh, image of the I, this closed subscheme of uh, X under the finite covering also. And I'm getting rid of certain uh, sets for technical reasons, basically, to have, I mean, not really technical, okay, uh, to have a well defined and well defined morphisms and beautiful morphisms, but I won't. I don't have time to go in there actually. But now this, I will denote such generalized the elliptic sheaves, the stack of them, by gl x over y di, and this stack actually is a dylan Manfred stack. Moreover, if you have non-trivial level structure, it's a scheme, and the morphism, the characteristic morphism, is proper. These are all needs to be proven, but I mean, I don't have time for this, unfortunately. And my aim is to uniformize the completion of this attack along the fiber over infinity using well, generalized Z divisible the infinity modules. These uh, Z divisible groups in general as are analogs of P divisible groups. Just, I mean, one maybe remark that I should make. Once we uh, put this condition on characteristic and look at uh, such generalized the elliptic sheaves, now it's a stack over Y minus P, e. not over X, but over Y. And I want to uniformize those. So uh, first, why? Uh, or, sorry, as I said, these uh, objects are can are analogs of p divisible groups in function field world. And actually, my way of uniformization is similar to the idea that uh, periodic uniformization of uh, Shimura curves of PEL type. Just FYI. So why p divisible groups first of all in classical case? So uh, let's say E is an elliptic curve. So we have a group structure on it, and by this group structure we can define this translation maps. Uh, and these maps have finite locally free kernel. Let's denote them by E n, right? In particular, we can define them for uh, p to the n also. And in this case, if you look for, uh, p to the n, where n is greater than or equal to one, these form an inductive system. And actually, this is called p divisible group now. And the beauty of the p divisible group is it knows a lot on about your elliptic curve actually, not the uh, items separately, but if you have this inductive system, then you know a lot on your elliptic curves. Then, once more, the question is, what are the analogs of these objects in function field world? <clears throat> uh, but first, <laughs> uh, I have to give more notations. I'm sorry for too many notations, but I have to give them. Uh, so, to uniformize these such letters, such generalized the elliptic sheaf, in this setting, first I have to restrict myself over Y. So, for just a short time, uh, I will be in the case where T is equal to 1 and X is equal to Y. And Z uh, will denote the uniformizer of O y infinity. We identify the completion uh, of O y infinity with FQZ and uh, the completion of the function field with uh, the Lorentz series, the power series and Lorentz series. Now FQZ will denote the ring of form formal power series uh, with indeterminant over FQ and from now on, all base schemes will be over spectrum of this FQ zeta. 
and one can relate this FQZ and FQZ by this morphism so that uh, the pullback of Z will give you zeta. So there are actually two different notations for Z and zeta, two roles of it. Uh, so I will use Z as uniformizer of OY infinity and zeta as an element of OS. And we'll denote uh, by NILP FQ zeta, the category of schemes uh, well, over spectrum of FQ zeta on which zeta is local nilpotent. Then now, oh sorry, and delta will be central FQ zeta algebra FQ to the d pi, uh, which satisfies such conditions. Now let S be in nilp. So as an analog of P divisible groups in classical world, Hartle gives us Z divisible groups. So a Z divisible group is an inductive system of FQ module schemes over S, such that the underlying group scheme of each EN is balanced group scheme. Uh, you can think balanced group schemes as uh, group schemes with FQ action, basically. And this I as uh, will denote the closed immersion, which identifies EN with EN Z to the N, the kernel uh, of multiplying uh, multiplication with Z to the N. And locally on S, there is an E uh, such that Z minus Zeta is acting on nilpotently on the Colby module. And a morphism of Z divisible groups is a morphism of inductive system. So now I want to consider uh, Z divisible groups with the infinity action. So a Z divisible, the infinity module is a Z divisible group, let's say E, with a D infinity action extending the action of FQZ here. So uh, now the question is then, so we saw that uh, to an elliptic, you can find the corresponding P divisible group to an elliptic curve, or actually in general abelian variety, but I won't go there. Uh, so now what's the, what's the, uh, the infinite, Z divisible the infinity module corresponding to uh, the elliptic shift case first. So now I'm still in the case where T is equal to one. So I don't uh, think of the cover right now. Z divisible the infinity module uh, will given by the following. So let E be a D elliptic shift and beta will be a morphism of schemes and will define, uh, so we have by, by periodicity, we know that ED is isomorphic to E0 alpha. The main idea is, so I have a global object and I want to look, I want to get a local object actually. So take the completion is the first idea. What I'm doing is taking the completion of EIs uh, along the fiber over infinity. And OS that will denote the uh, structure shift of the completion of Y times S along the fiber over infinity. So this has a D infinity action and uh, via the morphisms Ji and Ti's, one can define uh, such morphisms for uh, this formal completion, which then let's put epsilon zero, E zero to be the direct sum of these. Uh, by periodicity, it's enough to define tail D minus one. So this is enough. And we let lambda act on uh, this formal completion as a scalar here by taking pullback on here. So what we see is then 
e hat is actually sheaf of all delta times OS modules, and e hat has rank d cube over OS z. Co-kernel of f, f is defined by these morphisms coming from the diagonal morphisms on the uh, definition of the elliptic sheaf. And it has rank d over fq to the d times os. Now, by first two conditions, actually, one say, sees that this e hat f is a diodonate d infinity module, which is analog of the diodonate module in classical world. And via the third condition, we see that it's actually a formal d infinity abelian sheaf or uh, these formal sheets are categorically equivalent to certain z divisible groups. So, this is the z divisible group associated to a d elliptic sheet. Here, I want to give the definition of the other modules and formal sheets because I don't have time, but I hope it gives you the idea. There are many, as before, there are many. Uh, similarities between mixed characteristic and the cool characteristic. I list some of them. So in mixed characteristic, we have ZP, QP uh, with periodic topology, while in cool characteristic, we are working with FQZ and the uh, power series and Lorentz series with Zetadic topology. And width vectors are replaced by the structure shape of the completion of x times s along the fiber over infinity. Finite flat group schemes are replaced by balanced group schemes. P divisible groups are now z divisible groups. Theodonym, we have analogs of theodonym modules also. And actually, z divisible groups and theodonym modules are categorically anti equivalent. And we, have, we can associate a p divisible group in both cases. And in both cases, we have the ordinary money classification, which is a slope decomposition, actually, over an uh, algebraically closed field. And we have sartate in both cases, which tells us that the deformation of a p-divisible group is categorically equivalent to the formation of an abelian variety. Or I mean, in our case, the formation of a z divisible group and the formation of a d elliptic sheaf. And a Pratt plane replaced by Dreyfus a Pratt plane. And there is this formal scheme appearing in the uniformization of Shimura curves, actually, periodic uniformization of Shimura curves, which is called, I mean, Cherepnik Dreyfus uniformization. Uh, Dreamfeld introduced this moduli, this scheme as the moduli scheme of certain formal groups. And in our case, it will be moduli scheme of formal the infinity elliptic sheet. So, so far, we were on the uh, case when I have only one curve and one closed point. Then let's What's in the what's happening in the generalized case is that so I want local objects, right? I have many infinities and I want to consider around these infinities. Uh, so what I do is just take the t tuple of these uh, z divisible the infinity modules. So each of them is uh, Zj divisible the infinity j divisible module. Then well, one can associate a z divisible group to a generalized d elliptic sheet also. I will just give the idea is so let's say we have a generalized d elliptic sheet. Sorry. Uh, and beta will be a morphism of schemes. So what we did previously, since we have one infinity, uh, we take the formal completion along that infinity, right? So the idea is same. We, we will take formal completion along each infinity and around 
each infinity, these completions look like these E hats that defined uh, in the previous one. So uh, a generalized formal the infinity elliptic shift associated to a generalized the elliptic shift will look like T tuples of such objects. Then let's look at the uniformizing spaces. I hope I have time a bit. So we define the functor G gen from this uh, nil to set as taking a scheme here and sending it to isomorphism classes of triples of generalized formal the infinity elliptic shifts over S that are quasi-isogenous to a fixed uh, generalized formal the infinity elliptic shift. So this, if you see a bold curly E, it means it's fixed. And uh, one can prove actually that this G gen is representable by T tuples of this omega hat D. So now uh, we can, uh, we are very close to state our main theorem at least. Uh, more, even more notations. AF will, will denote the finite elements of our covering curve and the star EF will be the tuples uh, the x the x where but the finite then so x is not in is x is not any of the infinities and uh, this uh, the T I star will be a kernel of this map, which is, well, basically a quotient map because I is a closed, finite closed subscheme of X. So, uh, well, this group is like analog of congruent subgroups in classical case. So, now, how we state the theorem, sorry. So let's take a, an element in this functor, right? So we have beta, sorry, this is beta, is a morphism of formal schemes. And we have a generalized formal the infinity elliptic shift and uh, we will have a quasi-isogeny. Yeah, so let's start with such an element. So the being quasi-isogenous to this fixed uh, generalized form of the infinity elliptic shift, this uh, f hat actually gives us a generalized the elliptic shift f, which is quasi-isogenous to E via, let's say, alpha. And this f is called algebraization of this formal shift. Now, by using this alpha, one can construct a level I structure on F, at, on F, and over the algebraic closure of the residue field at infinity, the group of quasi-isogenies of E is uh, the immortable elements of the division algebra. So by using, uh, by using this, we get an action of the star on the functor, and we already know uh, that the star acts uh, on this, so we have a diagonal the star action on here. So, and this is all by definition, actually, this congruent subgroup is already an, uh, in the, the star uh, of A, so we have an action of it here also. So we define it by the following. So let's say, okay, I have to remark that this congruent subgroup acts only on the star uh, of others, not here. So let's take an element here. It sends uh, to the algebraization of the uh, formal sheaf 
together with a level structure. And what the theorem is actually saying that if I take formal completion of this guy along the fiber over infinity, it's an isomorphism. I'm not sure if I have time. I have three minutes. I can say a few words on uh, proof, maybe. It's uh, actually now let's put x for simplicity this side and y to be this side. And theta will be uh, x to y. Sorry, it's, I'm defining from x to y. Uh, so some properties of theta are its bijective on points. It is locally of finite type. It is formally a tile and it's radicial. And these these are enough actually. The proof is a bit technical, but now since theta is locally of finite type and formally a tile, it will be a tile. And since also since it's also radicial, it will be an open immersion. But an open immersion, which is that is bijective on points, is just an isomorphism. So the so that's the proof actually. And thank you. Thank you very much, Osge. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Remarks, comments. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can ask one question. Yeah. I I have actually a couple of, but I mean I have a lot, but <laughs> I will not ask all of them. <laughs> uh, just like generally about Dreamfeld modules. So you you mentioned that uh, Dreamfeld modules of rank two are kind of in correspondence with elliptic curves, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like curious if uh, there are some objects analo uh, in analogy with um, higher rank uh, than to in classical world. And uh, yeah, if it is the case, then uh, what are they? There are, I mean, there are Anderson defined T modules as mm -hmm. like a more higher dimensional. So let's go by in the sense of the following. So. Here in the definition of the Rimpad module, we have actually, you know, underlying additive group scheme. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anderson made a generalization of it and defined T modules such that the underlying group scheme is uh, GA to D, so D dimensional group scheme. Okay. So that then dream fact modules are just dimensional objects, actually. Was this? Yes, I guess so. Okay. Um, other questions? Okay, then let's thank you again. Thank um, you for listening and staying with me. <laughs> and I guess we'll stay uh, some five, ten minutes uh, more here to chat uh, in between, like, yeah, casually, let's say. Uh, please feel free to join us. Otherwise, please feel free. To <laughs> <laughs> See you next week. Yeah.